Government forces in East Pakistan surrendered today to India, bringing to an end 13 days of bitter fighting on that front. The end came quickly at a racetrack in Dhaka. There, General Niazi gave up the Pakistani armed forces in the east to Indian General Singh Arora. Niazi stripped off his epaulets and touched his forehead to Aurora's, signifying subservience. There was rejoicing in the streets of Dhaka. In New Delhi, a cheering, table-thumping parliament heard Indian Prime Minister Gandhi proclaim East Pakistan a free country. She called it Bangladesh, the Bengal nation. Mrs. Gandhi also ordered a unilateral ceasefire in the West beginning tomorrow, but Pakistan's President Yahya Khan, in a nationwide broadcast, urged his people to be patient and said we will continue fighting not only in the front lines, but in the fields, factories, and homes. CBS News correspondent Bert Quint, who has been covering the war in the East, returned to Calcutta after today's surrender, and I talked with him by telephone. Did you get the impression that the Indian Army was pretty efficient and the Pakistani Army was not, or how would you compare this? It wasn't so much a question of inefficiency of the Pakistani Army, Walter. It's just that they didn't have a chance from the start. Here were some 70 to 80,000 men in what amounted to a foreign country. East Pakistan is 1,300 air miles away from West Pakistan. The West Pakistanis who were flown over to put down the March uprising by the people favoring autonomy for East Pakistan were strangers. Not only were they strangers, they acted as an occupying force. They were terribly ruthless. This, these aren't just stories. These are things that we've seen ourselves. There were atrocities committed. So this was an occupying force, heated by the people who lived there, and the people were out to get them. And get them, indeed, they did in a good many cases. So here are these people, the West Pakistani soldiers, cut off from their main line of supply, surrounded by people who hated them and were out for revenge. And then along came the Indian Army, which is a, a pretty good army, and which terribly outnumbered and outgunned them. They simply didn't have a chance. What was interesting about this trip that we took from one end of uh, East Pakistan to the capital was that it, it eliminated any doubts in my mind, at least, about what this war was all about. There had been uh, talk by the Indians that they were in there to try to liberate the people. The Pakistanis were talking as though they were being uh, attacked, as they were, of course. And what impressed me was all along the route of the Indian Army march, the way people turned up from little villages and greeted the Indian Army as friends, as brothers, as saviors. Now, this is not a thing that comes natural to people living in Pakistan, you know, because the Indians and the Pakistanis, even the Bengalis, have been enemies for a good many years. I'm afraid that a lot of bloodshed is going to come now, now that the war in East Pakistan technically is over, because of the great desire for revenge of the people of East Pakistan and the fact that there are an awful lot of West Pakistani soldiers and civilian collaborators with the Pakistani army there that uh, are really in danger. In our trip up the river in these last couple of days, uh, we saw a few floating bodies, and villagers of the area told us that these were not individuals killed by war, but they were men killed after the Pakistani troops had pulled out of the area. Villagers, people who were out for revenge, killed them because they had either collaborated with the Pakistani army or actually formed a part of it. Did you get any uh, information as to what the Indian Army may do or be wanting to do to uh, set up protection for the West Pakistani soldiers and the, and the collaborator civilians? Yes, the, the first step is that they're taking the West Pakistani soldiers and putting them in the military cantonment. But what was very impressive about today was the fact that they did not disarm them immediately. They left the West Pakistanis with their guns not to protect them from the Indians, of course, but to protect them from East Pakistani Bengali citizens. Uh, what about the Indian soldiers and their attitude toward the Americans? Uh, you were traveling with them. Uh, were they aware of the, uh, of the uh, torment between our relations these days? Uh, they're very much aware of it, and they do a bit of healing. They 
teasing and joking about it. You don't really feel a resentment, uh, a terrible anti-Americanism. They seem a bit perplexed by it. They seem annoyed by it. And because of it, because of the fact that the 7th Fleet is reportedly on its way, they were anxious to get the job done, their job being to take Dhaka and win over East Pakistan in order to give it to the uh, Bangladesh government and, by the way, take it away from India's old enemy, Pakistan. Quint reported seeing fewer casualties, civilian or military, than he expected and noted that the Indian forces tried to avoid population centers in their bombing and artillery strikes. He also visited the neutral intercontinental hotel in Dhaka and said the American refugees there seemed in good shape. Mrs. Gandhi, in a note to President Nixon, has charged that America and other world powers could have prevented this war by exerting their influence to gain the release of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Sheikh Mujib is the popular East Pakistani leader who was arrested last March and imprisoned in West Pakistan. Some say he may be dead. Dan Rather reports from the Florida White House that sources are describing Mr. Nixon as disgusted that Mrs. Gandhi would attempt to blame others for the war. News Secretary Ziegler was instructed to tell newsmen that you don't prevent war by rolling out tanks and weapons. Rather also says the White House is still offering 7th Fleet ships in the Bay of Bengal if India wants to evacuate any Pakistanis, now technically prisoners. In an interview on the CBS Morning News, Pakistan Foreign Minister Buto said America and Communist China would probably be called on for more aid to his beleaguered country. We believe the United States people and the United States government have tried their best to assist us. I have no complaints on that score, but uh, if the fighting continues, I think not only the United States, but China will have to take much more cognizance of it. But you, China appears not to be in a position to help you at all. The Himalayas are, passes are shut now with the winter snow. It has no long-range airlift. Uh, isn't it vain to expect uh, help from that quarter? That's, uh, the snow doesn't last for all times. And uh, as I said, our dispute will continue if India wants to rub our nose to the ground. Mr. We, we cannot allow that to happen. Is it proper to assume that you, as a potential ruler of West Pakistan, are prepared to ask the United States and or China for military assistance, including troops? American troops we do not want. American troops uh, should not leave their shores not only for Pakistan, for other countries. We fight our own war, but assistance, moral, political, and others, we are prepared to seek. If they give it to us, we'll be grateful. If they don't give it to us, we'll understand. At midday, India's Foreign Minister Swaran Singh informed the Security Council of decisions in New Delhi and an entirely new state of affairs between India and Pakistan. This is, Mr. President, the information that I would uh, like to convey to the Council. In a nutshell, the fighting in Bangladesh has already stopped and on the West, unilaterally Prime Minister of India has issued orders to stop fighting effective from 10.30 a.m. On December 17th. In East Pakistan, as a current example, Eric Severide makes a case for turning forces of military into forces of mercy. Here is his analysis. In a few weeks' time, the West Pakistani army drove 8 to 10 million destitute East Pakistanis across into India. It will take months to sort them out and save them. In 13 days, the Indian army has smashed up thousands of Pakistani soldiers and civilians, and it will take weeks to salvage these people. A year ago, a cyclone hit East Pakistan, killing perhaps a half million people. Many could have been saved had communications not broken down. A year and a half ago, an earthquake in remote areas of Peru killed about 50,000 people. And it was six weeks before the Peruvian government had aerial photographs of just what had happened where. Nations can make war quickly and efficiently. They are not organized to use the same technology for the quick rescue of innocent human beings made victim by either wars or natural disasters. But it can be done. This week, the United Nations General Assembly voted for a long-range program to organize and coordinate disaster relief. It remains mostly a plan on paper, and presumably the United States will pay a heavy proportion of the cost. But technically, if not politically, the United States could do the job itself. Experience has demonstrated that our military planes and personnel, medical and otherwise, can move much faster into a disaster situation than the International Red Cross. 
The technology already exists, including the planes, the communications, and the computer systems. It is estimated that four or five of the modern C-5A cargo planes could have kept Berlin alive in the famous airlift of 48, a job that required fleets of the planes then available. Discussions on how to organize this technology for human relief have been going on here for many weeks, involving government officials, specialists from the so-called think tanks, and private industry. Several years ago, the Pentagon broached a plan for pre-positioning military tanks, guns, and supplies in various spots around the world for quick interventions. Congressmen killed the idea, arguing it would get us into wars too easily and quickly. But the same strategy can be used for relief supplies and personnel to get us into disaster situations easily and quickly. Natural disasters like cyclones, floods, earthquakes repeatedly happen in the same regions of the globe. Help could be close at hand at all times. The whole enterprise could be for America and America's image in the world, interventionism.